In his closing statement, Garvey's voice carried clear through the corridors and out to the street. I want no mercy, only justice, justice, justice. I would not betray my struggling race. If I did, I should be thrown into the nethermost parts of hell. After a four-week trial, his three co-defendants were acquitted, but Garvey was convicted and given the maximum sentence of five years in prison. Hoover's agents had the UNIA under surveillance for years in search of damaging evidence. But in the end, Garvey's conviction hung on using the mails to defraud one man, Benny Dancy, of $25. He took no advice. He did not heed advice. He felt that anything contrary to his view of things was an attempt to derail him or to deflect him from his goals. He had uh, just an overweening confidence in his own ability in areas where he had no expertise, such as in the case of ships, in the case of uh, trying a legal case, um, in his investment priorities. He, he just would not take advice. In February 1925, after nearly two years of appeals, Marcus Garvey was escorted to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary as prisoner number 19359. His only personal assets were $40 and a few hundred shares of his own worthless stock. UNIA members believed their leader had been railroaded. To dampen their frustration, Garvey wrote a song. Let no trouble worry you. Garvey's personal secretary, Amy Jakes, had become his second wife in 1922. While he was in prison, she and Garvey's followers struggled to keep the movement alive and raised tens of thousands of dollars for Garvey's defense. There's one group in rural Louisiana that gave on average five cents. They actually gave eight dollars, but when you actually counted the number of people involved, it actually amounted to something like five cents each. And it actually showed the level of loyalty that ordinary, the little people, had towards Garvey and the movement. People around the world began to send in petitions and letters and so on. There were literally millions, literally millions of signatures that were appended to petitions that were taken to various government agencies in Washington, D.C. In South Africa, people would have Marcus Garvey Sundays and pray for Garvey and so on. If they put you in a flame, though you should not bear the blame. But the government had its own reasons for wanting to release Garvey. Garvey had very weak lungs, and he also suffered from heart disease. He suffered from bronchitis and a series of asthma attacks, was often put in the prison hospital. They feared that he could die or become severely ill, and it would just add to the martyrdom aspect of the Garvey movement and increase his following. And there was an election year coming up in the U.S., and the Republican administration felt that black folk, who were largely Republicans in those days, might vote for the other party if Garvey was not released. On November 18th, 1927, after serving two years and nine months, Garvey was pardoned by President Calvin Coolidge. But he was ordered immediately deported. He was put on board the SS Saramaca, a ship owned by United Fruit, the same company on whose Costa Rican plantation he had worked as a young man. 
it was announced that Garvey would sail back to Jamaica from the port of New Orleans. It was a Monday morning in November. A cold, drizzly, damp November, New Orleans morning. It was more like a Mardi Gras day in New Orleans on that particular day. I went out to see Marcus Garvey on his ship. I imagine the conductors got tired of asking for fare, so some people rode for nothing. And the fare was only seven cents. And they were just packed on top of each other on the streetcar going out to the riverfront. And everybody went out with their children, everybody just to get that glimpse of him as the ship would leave. And the people could stand on the levee and stand close to the river. And, uh, you know, they were for miles and miles of other people. Mr. Garvey was not allowed to land. He had to stay on board ship. He did not put his foot on land. And he spoke to the people, bidding them farewell and wishing them well and asking them to hold on, keep the fort. As the uh, ship was moving out from the docks, the people on shore were singing the President General's hymn. One God, our firm endeavor, one a most glorious friend, one destiny forever. God bless our president. One we saw waving, we saw him do that with a handkerchief or something. But the people in general, they just was waving. Waving, 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 and crying and waving, crying and waving. And the waves appeared to have been in harmony with the song as the people were singing, and the boat was moving out to sea. They felt they was losing their father. Somebody so close to them are losing themselves. What are we gonna do? And my mother said until the day she died, she would not forget the sight of Garvey waving that white handkerchief as far as she could see the boat. Back in Jamaica, Garvey received a hero's welcome. He and Amy Jakes Garvey settled in Kingston and had two sons. He tried his hand at elective office, real estate, an amusement park, a collection agency, and a newspaper. But when an American court took title to his personal assets and all UNIA property from New York to Kingston, Garvey was forced to declare bankruptcy. <laughs> 